Gospel according to the Evangelist, St. Mark. and began to tell them what things should happen unto them, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests, and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. And James and John, the sons of Debedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldst desire for us do whatever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would you that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and one on thy left in thy glory. But Jesus said unto him, Ye know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized, with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand, and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him, and saith to them, You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. At that time, one of the Pharisees desired Jesus that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed him five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet, my head with an oil, with oil thou hast not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Glory to There's an inexorable movement 
in the minds of human beings and in our souls from understanding how much sin we've committed and from owning up to our sin before God and how much we love God. That is the message in our gospel today. And I guess in light of that message, it's good for us to ask ourselves some questions. If we've been forgiven, we need to make a mental list of it. So I'd ask you this question. I ask myself this. How many sins have I committed? Does anybody have a number they want to give me? Perhaps we can't number our sins. Can we even number the categories of our sins? Like throw them into broad categories of adultery, or lust, or abuse, or anger, lying. Can we even number the categories of our sins? Well, I think we all stand condemned before God. We've broken his laws. We're guilty of sins. Have you ever asked God to forgive you of your sins? Have you ever tried to list your sins before God and try to number your sins? Have you ever come to confession with a broken heart and asked God for forgiveness of your sins? Have you ever approached Him in worship with a broken heart like the woman that we study today in our gospel? How much do you love God? I think we learned today that when we see ourselves as chief among sinners, we're more likely to love more. But when we think we're holy and righteous, we love little. And Jesus says, little's to forgive, little is there forgiven to the one who loves little. And the one who loves little is the one who doesn't see himself or herself as much of a sinner. The one who's forgiven a lot, in other words, everything, is the one who sees how sinful they really are. And truly, as I said, there's a connection between our love quotient for God, how much we love God, and isn't that what the Christian life's all about? To love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and then to love our neighbors, ourselves. If we would arrive at love, we start with brokenness about our own sins. So, review these questions. How many sins do you have? How many categories of sins do you have? And how much do you love God? How much do you worship God? Today, there was a sinner in our gospel. It says she was a sinner. There was no hiding the fact she was a sinner. Matter of fact, she was known throughout the city as a sinner. And she was a woman. She went down to a Pharisee's house. Itself probably a bold move, a very bold move. It's amazing when somebody gets a view of Christ, how nothing will stop them from being where he is. And so she went with an alabaster box of ointment, and she came in to the house of the Pharisee. And it says this beautiful sentence about her actions in that home. It's a great view into the heart of a woman, a heart of a human being that's been touched by the grace of God and is driven truly to worship. And so it says that she stood at his feet in humility. The posture of being bowed down was like the publican in the temple versus the Pharisee who stood up. She's there at his feet. She's weeping. She's broken. Her emotions are touched. Her entire being is touched. It's not a cold, intellectual love. It's a brokenness before God in humility. And she begins to wash his feet with tears flowing down. So many tears. You could wash someone's feet. Not a drop, not two drops, but a flow of tears, weeping. And she washes his face, his feet with tears. And then she wipes them with her hair. There was dirt on his feet. And she took that off gladly with her own hair. How intimate of a communion was this. And then when she was done, she anointed his feet with that ointment that she bought. Expensive ointment. This is acceptable worship. 
It's worship and love for God. And truly, it's from the heart. How little our heart, which is portrayed by the fathers as the center of your soul, is touched to the point like this, where you're broken before God with your sins and you can truly worship Him. The moments are few. If you experience them, remember them, hang on to them, thank God for them. She worshiped Him deeply, directly to the Lord. She went into His presence. And what a contrast it is for the Pharisee, this one who'd invited him, somewhat disingenuously, I'd say, stood afar off watching us all. He was disquieted. He wondered, how can this man be a prophet if he accepts this closeness to a sinner? His heart was cold. He didn't see any reason to weep. He didn't see any reason to wipe Jesus' feet or to kiss his feet. He stood there eye to eye with Jesus and asked him this question in his heart. How could you do this to a sinner, a woman a sinner? You see, Simon didn't love God, and he really didn't love others either. It could be said that if he truly loved others, he would have taken the least of these among the brethren and among the people of the country and this prostitute and welcomed her. But his heart was cold, and the Lord, recognizing this, answers his question in a very good way. He says there was a certain creditor that had two debtors. Of course, the creditor is God, right? And so we stand as debtors to this one great creditor, the heavenly banker, the one that's looking at all of your life and adding up everything. And there's two debtors. This is one owed 500 pence, is a pretty good sum. And then the other owed 50. But it's interesting that regardless of the amount, the absolute amounts, neither one could pay. They were both as bankrupt regardless of how much they owed. I think that's a picture of us. You see, some of us truly are greater sinners in number of sins, and perhaps the depth of our sins. But all of us are like these, one of these two men. Regardless of the ultimate amount of our sins, before God, we're not righteous. We've broken his law. We've got sins innumerable. We're standing there, we can't even number our sins from the last week, probably. Let alone for our entire life. And so, we are truly debtors. Perhaps we're like the Pharisee thinking, well, I've only got so many sins or just a few sins and I'm okay. But we've lost the perception of reality or status before God. When we start to compare ourselves with ourselves, the Holy Scriptures say we're unwise. We need to compare ourselves to God's standard. So the Lord says these two couldn't pay. But then the master forgave both. That's like God. God's not enumerating sins to determine whether he can forgive you or not. Like you've got like so many sins and the other guy's got more than you so you can be forgiven and he can't. That's not the way God operates. God wants to forgive everyone. And so when God forgives, the creditor forgives. The Lord asks Simon to think about this in terms of love. Who's going to love the most? And he answers rightly. He says, I suppose, he says, the one whom he forgave most. An interesting answer. The Lord takes it and then answers it. He says, you've answered rightly. For our benefit this is. Because it's true that there's two ways to look at your sins. You can look at them in relation to the size of the pile versus somebody else's. Or you can look at them in a different way, which is that you look at yourself just before God, and you see yourself like the Apostle Paul did, as the chief of sinners. These are the two ways to look at sins. And if we want to be forgiven the most, our challenge is to see ourselves not in light of men, but in light of God, and God's perfection, and God's holiness, 
in God's kingdom and his righteousness. And so it is that the Lord castigates Simon. He says, Simon, look at all that she did. She kissed me. She wept for me. She put ointment on me. You did nothing. And you haven't done it to anyone else either. And so you fail on the love portion, Simon. And it's because your love has failed because you don't see yourself as a sinner before God. And you have no humility. You've lost not just the forgiveness of God, but the pathway to love for God. Such a sad story. But a man so close to the Lord can be so far away. And it's because of his view of himself. A false view of self. The Lord gives this great encouragement to us. He says that her sins, her sins which are indeed a big plot. She's chief among sinners in reality, if you want to count them up, if you could. Yet her sins are forgiven because she loves much. She knows that she's a great sinner before God. Not comparing herself to anyone else, just to the Lord. And you, you don't see any need for forgiveness. Your sins pile so small, so insignificant, that you can beat on your breast and say, I thank you, I'm not like other men. And certainly not like this prostitute here. This is where we find ourselves. Somewhere in between these two poles. We see ourselves as really great sinners. And we come to God that way. You see the love that comes out of a heart that sees how sinful it is? The love that comes out, that is poured out to God, is true worship acceptable to God. And it brings peace with God. It brings reconciliation. It brings being in the presence of God. This is what God wants. He wants us sinners to be before him at his feet. He wants us to be gathered around him, not standing afar off like Simon. He wants us to be brought near. And that bringing near to God, that reconciliation, as he says at the, way, at the end, he says to her, your faith is saved and go in peace. He wants us to be in that place where our faith and our love for God comes out of this great understanding of how much we need God. God wants us to be restored to Him. And that restoration, that conclusion, that ability to be in peace with God comes out of true worship, working for God, doing what God wants. And it's a righteousness which comes from an understanding of who God is and who we are. And certainly, who we were. Perhaps we've lost sight of ourselves. But God wants us to increase our love. He wants our humility to be increased. He wants our understanding of our great sinfulness to be increased. And he wants us to be at peace with him. You know, worship and righteousness come out of love. From a faith that puts us at peace with God. Perhaps today we're on our Lenten journey and we've kind of fallen down. We've fallen away from God. We're struggling. The Lord says today, come acknowledge your sinfulness. I understand your sin before you do. Jesus read the mind, the thoughts of Simon. God knows our sins. And despite that, and because precisely that he wants us at his feet, he calls us back. Might God bring us in repentance to him? Might we come truly committed to him? Understanding how we need him, how desperately we need him, but yet how great he wants us to be received at his feet. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah.